All right, so we're going to go to uh, Romans 8 today. Romans 8, 18 through 23, or probably 25, actually. It's on page 1,184. Thousand one hundred eighty-four. Romans eight is a pretty well-known chapter in the Bible because it talks about the hope that we have and what we are going to become, and how nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This passage in particular is about suffering and hope. So let me read it. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up into the present time, not only so, so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons of the resurrection of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. This is the word of the Lord. So I have asked this, have you been asked this question lately? So what are you going to do with the rest of your life? If you're graduating from eighth grade or perhaps high school or perhaps college and maybe you've been out of college a year or two and you're thinking, you know, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? That's a very uh, good question. Often if we're in that point, we have sort of an idea, but we don't know the particular. Someone asks us uh, again and again, maybe our parents, we say, you know, I got an idea. And I hope it works out, but we often don't know exactly. Uh, this question applies to some of us who are a little bit older too, right? Sometimes we get in a job and also we lose a job and you think, well, now what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And of course it applies to us when we get older and our health sort of disappears or maybe we retire and from time to time in areas of our life we ask this question, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? But today as we enter into again our series on heaven, our present future home, I want to ask that question in the context of dying, rising again, and then having all of eternity to live. So a couple weeks ago I talked about the fact that we're going to have a body and the new heaven and the new earth. Today I'm going to talk about what we're going to do with that body. And to understand a little bit of what we're going to be able to do with that body, I've got to go back to the beginning of the Bible to understand a little bit of how people were originally created. So we start with our passage in Romans 8. 18, and it says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. It doesn't take too much uh, analysis to figure out that we suffer. There is a lot of suffering. There's also a lot of joy, but there's a lot of suffering in the world. But we might ask, well, where, where did this come from? And if you've been in church a little while, you know about creation, you know about fall, you know about all suffering came into the world through a rather unfortunate event involving, well, maybe not an apple, but some fruit. And uh, that's sort of what happened. You know that story a little bit. If you don't know it, you can read Genesis 1 and 2 and 3. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, after that, how long these people who lived in the fall lived because they lived with suffering but they also lived with great abilities so this is a timeline of uh, well really the first people who lived on earth so Adam, Seth, Enoch, Canaan, Mahalel, Jared, Enosh they all lived about you know on average let's just say 900 years that's a long time anybody know anybody who's lived 900 years right it doesn't, it just doesn't happen. You watch movies, movies are fascinated with this theme, right? And then, you know, but it doesn't really happen. Highlander back in the day, remember that? Rah, there can be only one. Maybe you didn't watch that. You don't need to watch it, it's not that good. But, uh, you know, this whole idea that people might live forever is kind of a thought that's on our heart because we have eternity on our hearts. But back in the day, they lived a long time, but they didn't live forever and their lives uh, weren't perfect. 
at all. So if you think about what could happen if you live to be, let's say, 900 years old, it's helpful to uh, think about it maybe 30 year period. So it takes 30 years to about sort of learn, that is, to get to be um, an adult. Now if you're under 30 and you're an adult, I get it, you know a lot of stuff, but um, generally speaking, by the time you reach to be 30, it's sort of a synergy, you've learned a lot, and then 30 years to earn, and then 30 years to return if you get to be 90 years old, which of course doesn't always happen. So the point is, it takes about 30 years to get established in the world and to figure out where the food is, where the house is, maybe uh, just to figure out how to live, and 30 years, another 30 years to sort of build a house and maybe have another place to go to, to figure out where the food is, where the water is, uh, how to live life, and after that, things can get pretty comfortable. Most of us maybe can retire when we're 60 or 70. And you think about it, if you were going to live another 800 years, you could just build on to what your abilities were and you would get to be a very, very powerful person that is just in your sort of humanity as long as your health held together. If you just got to be a lot older, you would also get to be a lot more powerful, right? So here in the Bible, these people got to be very old and very uh, influential even though uh, they weren't uh, perfect anymore. And you can actually kind of see how this timeline goes. Um, a couple of them probably ended their lives at the flood. Methuselah and Lamech died about the same time of the flood. And of course Noah, Noah went through the flood and everybody else lived after the flood. Um, what I want to focus on though is just their power and their uh, ability. And not only theirs, but some other people who lived at that time. Ever heard of the Nephilim, right? The Nephilim were in the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans, the daughters of men, and had children by them. They were heroes of old, men of renown. And what this talks about is people who weren't righteous, but people who were uh, sort of the opposite of righteous. And, and the Hebrew interpreters of this passage would look at this and go, these are probably people um, the daughters of men are, are daughters of humans, and the sons of God are people, uh, well not people at all, angels, probably fallen angels, who had relationships with the daughters of men, and then these men of renown were born, sort of half people and half, uh, well, angel. And I don't know how that works, but eventually God put a stop to it. Uh, but the point is, they're called sons of God, went to the daughters of humans, and had children by them. All of this is, these are great, amazing, powerful, long-lived people. Even though they were living past the fall, were still had great abilities and were incredibly powerful. Now, what does this all have to do with our passage back in Romans? Well, the world wasn't as it was supposed to be. This is the next passage in Genesis 6. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. That's pretty, that's pretty significant. And of course God didn't like that, so he sent the flood. That didn't work that well in terms of affecting his heart, so he sent a better thing, which is Jesus. And then through Jesus, he doesn't only destroy, but he builds up. And then in Jesus, we have a little bit of the glory that Jesus has, and someday we're going to have more. And I said all that, to say this. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Notice the wording there. In the Old Testament, the sons of God were the angels, the sons of God, more than likely the fallen angels. In this passage, the sons of God is us. It's us. So Paul here, who knew, who would have been very familiar with the Old Testament passages, is saying that we're going to be amazing people somehow. We're going to live forever. We're going to be perfect. We're going to be powerful. We're going to be glorified. It's going to be stunning in terms of who we are going to be. And then it goes back into this text here. The creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice. So it's all is bad, and then all is going to be good in the future. So... I don't know if I explained that that well. The point is this. 
The world is a messed up place. We suffer, but someday it's going to be restored. And even the glory that was present in the old uh, people, the men of renown, is somehow going to be made magnified in us. And we're going to be made new. And all of creation is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. Well, who are the sons of God? You are the sons and daughters of God who are going to inherit, are going to become something more than you currently are. And it's going to be tremendous. Now, I got some illustrations here to illustrate um, really some of this dynamic that's going to happen. And I got to get into the story a little ways back. So I guess I know that I've always been able to fix stuff, but I never really realized explicitly that um, I was mechanically inclined. I just sort of did it. But a couple years ago, our van was falling apart. Literally, the door had fallen off and it was on the ground. And I sort of put it up again and then locked it so it went open. And, and then a bunch of other stuff broke. And uh, eventually, Marshall's looking at me going, look, either we're going to get rid of this van or you should try to fix the van, but I don't want to drive a hoopty uh, anymore. Uh, hoopty's a messed up car. So uh, one Saturday, I was not doing that well. I was kind of tired and uh, had... Uh, pre-message syndrome perhaps and uh, I thought I just got to go out and try to fix this dumb door and I took the door off found the part went over to Weller it was actually two years ago almost to the day and uh, and got a part put it back on and it mostly worked and then I fixed the three or four other things I thought oh that was kind of fun that was kind of life-giving and then it just went on from there and since then I've replaced an engine in a vehicle I fixed an engine in a vehicle I fixed other people's vehicles and now it's gotten too much that I need to sort of put a lid on that and not do it all the time. Coming out of that, I realized there's some other fun things to do too. And so uh, somewhere along the line, I started making yogurt. Now, what is the connection to yogurt in this? Well, I figure, you know, in the land of Canaan, they were promised a land flowing with milk and honey. And one of the things you can do with milk and honey is make sweet yogurt. Actually, uh, it's, just an in, it's just a thing about what God has sort of enabled me to do and it's giving life to me. So, a long time ago, I heard that you can make yogurt, and it's not that hard, and I read an article, you know, you look at these articles, and then I started trying it, and now I can make yogurt in about uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Sometimes Marsha cleans up the mess, sometimes she doesn't. Um, I do, I guess I should say. So, all you have to do to make yogurt is take a gallon of milk, pour it in a pot like this, and what I do is I boil it for 22 minutes, exactly, I time it so I don't have to watch it, because that's not that fun. And then I turn it off, chill it for about seven minutes, down to 110 degrees, mix some yogurt culture in, and set it in a heating pad overnight. And it turns into yogurt. Now, of course, you can't see this that well, but I'll, uh, I'll mix it up and I'll pour it over because I don't like this yogurt uh, as thin as it is. I like it a little bit thicker, so I make Greek yogurt. And I pour it through this muslin here. And then, of course, the whey comes out the bottom and it turns into this uh, really quite uh, yummy. Uh, Greek yogurt and you know I look at this and I think okay it's just yogurt it's kind of plain but it's a good representation of what heaven's going to be like because we have these abilities now we have this stuff that we can do now and it's kind of tasty but in heaven it's just going to get more and more um, uh, significant and more and more in depth. So even now, I just made this. It tastes a lot like goat cheese, but it's a really thick yogurt. And my kids were eating it, and they're going, "Oh wow, that uh, tastes just like goat cheese." And we like goat cheese. So this is goat cheese without the goats. But I also know there's more things you can make with yogurt. You can make tzatziki. You can make frozen yogurt. We hear about this all the time. Froyo, right? Have any of us made it? I don't know. The point is, there's unlimited creative potential almost just in yogurt. Someday I want to find out exactly what happens with the chemical structure in yogurt to make it all thick from runny milk to thick yogurt and how the whey comes out. Maybe I'll make whey powder someday, probably in heaven because it's a lot of work and I don't want to do everything right now. Um, but the point is, there's stuff we learn now that's going to go into heaven and it's going to be expanded, it's going to be made new, partly because of time, partly because of new body, partly because of lack of suffering. So maybe you don't like yogurt. Uh, let's talk about some basic chemistry here. And I really should have Ruth come up here sometime because Ruth and Roger were chemists. Um, but this is my basic chemistry. So anybody know what uh, potassium nitrate, charcoal, and sulfur make? Do you know what, that ma do you know what it makes? What's that? Gunpowder. Yeah. 
So you hear about this, right? The ancient Chinese invited and invented gunpowder in the ninth century, right? Pretty easy, basic components. Like maybe a, that'd be kind of fun to do sometime. But do we do it? Uh, maybe some of you do it. Maybe some of you don't. Who's made gunpowder? A couple people, right? So it turns out that I had most of this stuff in my house. I spent some time yesterday looking for sulfur, and it turns out I had two big things in my uh, basement. But we all have some charcoal, perhaps, if you have a fire pit. Um, this is something I bought, potassium nitrate. So here's, here's how this works. I put it, I pre-measured it. Put 75% potassium nitrate. You put, by weight now, you put 15% by weight, not volume, uh, charcoal, that's why it's black. And then you put a little bit of sulfur, you can actually use powdered sugar too. Um, you put that in there. And separately, of course, they're rather inert. You can burn charcoal but uh, it's not explosive. And you put it together, and you mix it up for a while. It has to be pretty, uh, pretty thoroughly mixed. And then you take it out, and much to my sadness, you don't light it in church. <laughs> because it produces an incredible amount of horribly accurate smoke. It's horrible. I really wanted to do this, but it, you really can't. Um, so I'll do it afterwards on a brick outside. It's, it's quite amazing how you can take household items and create incredibly dangerous, flammable, and fun stuff, right? And of course, unless you wrap it up in like cardboard and really tightly, you won't blow your fingers off. Although you can start a pretty significant fire and it's a lot of fun. So here, here's the point. Why am I talking about yogurt and stump remover and gunpowder in church when you may or may not be interested in doing any of this thing, any of this? But I want to ask, well, what are you interested in? What's on your heart that maybe you're doing now already? Or maybe you just always have it on your heart, but you never can quite do it. It's like we're in this preparation time that's really very short, although it seems so incredibly long because it's our whole life. And someday we'll graduate. The world will be restored after some point in time. New heaven and new earth. And we'll get all of eternity without any health problems, without any uh, temptation uh, issues from the enemy problems. But we'll get to explore a creation that is full of opportunity infinitely complex, infinitely amazing, and we get to do more and more and more. And it's, you say a million years and you think, well, I can't even visualize. But visualize like 30 years and then 30 years and another 30 years, and it just keeps going and going and going. And so many images and visions of heaven picture it as a very boring kind of, uh, kind of just flat place. And even if you look at popular culture, some of you watch Star Trek, there's a character on Star Trek that's called Q. And Q is an infinite, almost godlike being, but basically the Q get bored, and eventually they resort to just kind of teasing and poking around with the people that aren't immortal. But if you look at creation, you look at the infinite complexity of creation, it just keeps going. I'll give one illustration of this. Uh, a couple weeks ago I talked about having children in heaven, right? And you know, I don't know for sure, but it seems to make a lot of sense that we're people that have kids now. Why would that all be stripped away and not have kids in heaven? Um, if all, God resurrected all the people that died in him that he chose to save in him, and he resurrected them all, we'd probably all fit on earth. Like, throughout all of history, he resurrected them all. We'd probably all fit on earth. But if we have kids, eventually it's going to get pretty crowded here on earth, right? Think about all of creation, not just all of our earth, but think of the whole universe. And some of you have uh, explored this a little bit because you're interested in the stars. There's a picture, it's actually, I think it's in Cindy's office too, but there's a picture and it basically represents an area of space that is about the size of a dime at arm's length. And it's taken by the Hubble telescope some years ago. And in that one picture, blown up, I don't know how many galaxies are in there, but there's hundreds, perhaps a thousand galaxies in that one little spot. Every galaxy is, a, is an actual galaxy that's just huge and massive and could have potentially an unbelievable amount of planets. And that's just, the point is this. We always think because we have finite minds that all of eternity is just going to be kind of wear out and we won't know what to do and we're just going to sit there praising God and 
And that's awesome, and that's great, and that's true, but there is unlimited creative potential. And what the Bible teaches through a variety of passages is that, yes, when we get to heaven, our prayers are going to be answered in many ways, and God will probably tell us some things like why we had to go through so many difficult things that will all make sense or won't matter as much as it does now. But it's not like God is going to tell us everything about yogurt or gunpowder when we get to heaven. There'll still be things to do. And those of us who are teachers might still teach. Those of us who are chemists will be chemists again. Those of us who are bakers will probably still bake amazing bread. And maybe we'll get into other um, professions, things like science fiction uh, pulls out, like terraforming perhaps, or perhaps God will do all the terraforming. But there's going to be amazing things, and just like I've discovered yogurt making and gunpowder, hopefully I don't blow my fingers off and have to get my fingers given back to me in heaven, but um, there's so many amazing things that we can discover and have brand new life, and that's part of what makes life worth living here on earth, this newness, this, this differentness, this new project, because God created us like that. And that's going to be the same way in heaven, where there's amazing, wonderful things to learn, things that we haven't conceived of, where no eye has seen, no ear has heard, as the Bible says. And it's going to be tremendous. So some of you are thinking, well, what's, what's the Bible passage? What, what, uh, what Bible passage are you talking about here. So let me find it. Let me find it here. Revelation 21, 24 says this, the nations will walk by its light, the light of heaven, and the kings of earth will bring their splendor into it. And then it goes on in the next uh, two verses later, it says the glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it, that is heaven. So my point this morning is there's both continuity and foretaste now to what we do now that leads into heaven. There's continuity in the sense that things that you do now are going to be brought into heaven. So not only the good works, but the things you create, your abilities, what God has called you to do, your gifts, your calling, your... So if you're a chemist now, I think you're going to get to heaven. You're not going to forget all the chemistry you know now. If you know about three phase electricity, you're not going to get to heaven God, and you're going to be like, what's the phase? I got no idea. Uh, God is going to take what we know now and perfect it and bring it into heaven. Also, what we have now is a foretaste. It's a foretaste. This experience of learning new things is a foretaste of the future glory that we'll, we'll have in heaven. I want to close on a passage that's at the end of this. And still fighting with this here a little bit. The church often teaches, um, or we often catch, and perhaps we put it on ourselves even, that Christianity is a fairly small set of moral requirements that we just have to do. And so we have, some impulses are good, some are bad. Some are helpful, some aren't. Sometimes we go, this feels so right, and it is so right. Sometimes we say, this feels so right, but I know it's so wrong. And often as a church, we'll sort of say from the Bible that, well, you can't do those things. You can't do that. You can't. And that's, that's all true because that's not often how God has called us to live. But how this works is when the Spirit lives in us, the Spirit convicts us, the Spirit guides us forward to life that is everlasting, that is abundant. So what I want to do as we close is invite you to consider the smallness of what God might be asking you to give up to the richness, to the abundance of what God wants to give you. Glory in the future and glory now. I've given up a lot in some ways, although far less than others, to be a follower of Jesus. But I receive things back, like even this mechanical ability that far exceeds any of the garbage I've been asked to give up. We're called to be a church that's filled with this glory, and some of that glory comes now, and some of that glory, all of that glory, is going to come when the heaven and earth are restored. So much of our heart longs for eternity, and that's exactly what God's heart longs for Two, I want to invite you to pray with me as we lead into communion. So, Father God, you are our God. 
And we thank you that you've created us with flesh and blood and spirit. And we thank you that you do teach in scripture time and time and time again that you care about who we are holistically. We thank you that you give us a promise of a new heaven and a new earth. We thank you that you promise to make all things new. We thank you that you don't ask us to give up things sort of arbitrarily, but you ask us to give up things that take our life away and drain it out of us. And you offer us so much more. You offer us abundance. You offer us purpose. You offer us joy, not only joy in knowing you and doing devotions and hearing and reading your word, but you offer us joy in the very uh, tactile, real, physical things of life, whether it's woodworking or engineering or, or cooking or just taking a walk on this beautiful earth that you created. But I pray that you be with each one of us here. I ask that you put hope in our hearts. I ask that you to give us a vision of what we are called to be. I ask that you'd protect us. I ask that you'd sanctify and cleanse and heal and deliver our loved ones. I ask that you'd help us to be what we're called to be. As we enter into communion, I pray that you would fill this place with your love, with your power, and enter into our very lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.